Welcome to Recognizing and Treating Hyperkalemia in Patients with Heart Failure and or Chronic Kidney Disease, an update for hospitalists. I'm Dr. George Backris. I'm joined today by Dr. Eliana Pina and Dr. Vincent Salvador, and we're hopefully going to present to you uh, a nice overview of this area and how to utilize it uh, clinically. So with that, let's start off by getting to know the new potassium binders. What are they? Why are they important? And how they work? And I'm going to be able to go through that with you now. So first of all, let's talk about the prevalence of hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia prevalence is about two to three percent in the general population. And when you look at all hospitalized patients, there's a variance there depending on their kidney function primarily and their concomitant disease. But 1 to 11 percent, depending on the definition of hyperkalemia. And then when you make the definition 6 or higher, it becomes about 1 percent. Patients with heart failure, MACE, and death-related uh, uh, rates were consistently lower in patients treated with RASI blockers. I think that's very important, ACEs and ARBs, than those not treated with them. And the data there is very, very clear. These agents should not be stopped. They are primarily because of hyperkalemia. We're going to talk about it. And prevalence in patients with stage 3 or greater CKD, especially those with stage 3B CKD, that is a GFR of less than 45, is really where you're going to see hyperkalemia. And again, like what I mentioned about heart failure, this is the group that hyperkalemia limits the use of ACEs and ARBs. And in fact, it should not be limited to very good data that people do well. Now, what about all-cause mortality? What about the definition of hyperkalemia? There was a very large database analysis looking at over 900,000 patients over an 18-month period focusing on mortality. That was the only thing that was looked at. <clears throat> it is a database. But if you look at this carefully, what you see is the top curve is the combination of people with heart failure, CKD, and diabetes. And if you'll go down below, you'll notice that the curve starts going up with a potassium of around 5. So you don't have to, 5.5, it's already up, and 6, it's way up. Now, that's compared to control, and it's compared to diabetes alone. But even if you have kidney disease and heart failure without diabetes, the curve is lower, but nevertheless, it still swung a little bit over to lower levels of potassium. The point of this is that hyperkalemia, as we traditionally define it, 5.5, 6, maybe if you have these concomitant diseases, should be a bit lower towards 5. So it's just something for you to notice and a very good database to support it. Healthcare costs and readmission rates after discharge in patients with hyperkalemia related hospitalizations are very high and very important. You can see here when you look at total costs after one year, they're almost double in people with hyperkalemia. So clearly, there's a need to not only manage hyperkalemia, and traditionally, of course, we've really not done a very good job of it because we really haven't had a lot of tools, and diets, while they do help, do not solve the question. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that we need to look at this in terms of better uh, ways to solve the problem. Now, when you look at variability to the definitions, I mentioned this already, and you can see here the variety of definitions and how they're, they're looked at. And again, these are based on standard laboratory measures that have already kind of uh, centralized this. There are several mechanisms that are responsible for controlling serum potassium levels. So, and keep in mind, potassium is an intracellular ion. It's not an extracellular ion like sodium. And so if you're seeing changes, it really is uh, abundant um, extracellular amounts on top of the intracellular amounts. 
there are a number of agents that have traditionally been used acutely insulin beta-2 agonists will over the span of a few minutes put potassium into the cell and take it out of circulation that doesn't mean you've solved anything it simply shifted things from one compartment to another and then if you look at things that block potassium uptake like beta blockers that's actually going to make things worse that's not going to make things better and DIG likewise and of course the RAS blockers mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and heparin also are going to make things worse so you need to be aware of things that manage potassium as opposed to positive and negative so you can get a flavor for this so again things controlling potassium the gut only handles 90 only handles 10 percent of the body's potassium the kidney handles 90 percent and even in advanced kidney disease the gut handles more and more but even in dialysis patients the kidney which handles nothing the gut can only handle 20 percent so there's a problem <clears throat> in terms of dealing with potassium as kidney function declines and I think that's important for you to keep in mind when you're looking at this now restricting dietary potassium is critical there is a variety of fishes and you have a mnemonic here that you can uh, kind of go by in foods that are very rich in potassium so you can remember the mnemonic potassium and you can see here there are representatives under each level letter uh, for you to uh, remember this by but this mini education to patients actually can reduce potassium by as much as 0.5 milliequivalents if they're very strict to it but you notice a lot of good things are on this list and there are a lot of things that are not on this list uh, so keep in mind this does help but it doesn't answer the problem so adherence to dietary restrictions I've already mentioned to you is very difficult and low sodium diet is difficult but here it's very very difficult to take away things like cantaloupe and sweet potatoes avocados things people really like tomatoes um, and then expect them to really follow through so don't expect this to be the end-all be-all yes it works but very few people can actually follow this there are a number of causes and treatments for hyperkalemia across the continuum commonly the underlying factor here is going to be kidney disease either acute kidney disease or chronic kidney disease either way potassium is going to be an issue obviously dialysis patients are going to have a major issue and transplant patients primarily because of the transplant medications are going to have a problem with hyperkalemia and there are other diseases like rhabdomyolysis etc but again what is the commonality kidney disease so it's important to understand that this is the key underlying factor what are the traditional approaches we touched on this earlier and let me come back to it insulin beta agonists those are immediate factors to shove potassium into the cell they're going to last a few minutes maybe 15 minutes that's it then you're in trouble calcium guess what that only stabilizes the cell it doesn't really treat the potassium so all these factors that you've been given you think you're out of the woods you're good for 10 to 15 minutes and then you're not out of the woods loop diuretics sodium bicarbonate those definitely help but again those take a little longer to work uh, dialysis everybody wants to go to dialysis the reality is and I'm speaking to you as a nephrologist it takes a few hours to set up the dialysis machine and that's assuming people are already there and once you start dialysis the first dialysis run you're not going to be able to remove very much a four-hour run gets rid of 90 milliequivalents four hour you cannot do a four-hour run when you first hook the patient up maximum you can do two hours so you'll get rid of some but it's also not the end-all be-all and then stopping ACE inhibitors and whatever those help but again those are not going to answer the question so really what you're left with what you've been left with is SPS as a potassium binder 
And we all know that that may work once, but on a long-term basis, that is not really what you want. You want something that can be given and clearly be sustained and well-tolerated. A little bit of history on SPS. It's very old. The, the regulatory pathway was very, very weak. You did not need to do very much <clears throat> back then to really get things through. And so as a result, people were using it PRN over the years. Now we found out that it could cause colonic necrosis with the sorbitol when administered. And so now there's black box warnings. So this is really not what people thought it was and has limitations. And in fact, here you see a nice summary of the newer potassium binders, Petiramir and SZC. These are different agents. Petiramir has a calcium base, not a sodium base. And while SZZ has a sodium base like SPS, its molecular structure is totally different. It is not a resin and does not behave as a resin. And as a result, reacts differently. So if you look, if you give these agents when people hit the emergency room, you won't get a response immediately, but they are working in the background and you'll get a response with Petirmer within six to seven hours and with SCZ within three to four hours, primarily because it changes the pH and pushes, just like bicarbonate, pushes potassium into the cell. But remember, it's the distal colon that handles potassium. It need, these drugs need time to get to the distal colon, and that's roughly about seven hours. And then you can start binding potassium and eliminating it through the colon. The major side effects of Petiramir is constipation without any question, and the major side effect of SCZ is edema because of the sodium load. But that's at higher doses. At lower doses, they're generally very well tolerated. And I'll show you some data about that in a second. But first, let's pause to look at the mechanisms of action better than I just described. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate, or SPS, is a polymer cation exchange resin. SPS is also a non-selective potassium binder. As SPS moves through the intestinal tract, it exchanges sodium for potassium and is eliminated by the fecal route. However, SPS is non-selective. It can also bind to other cations, including magnesium, calcium, or sodium. Petiramir calcium sorbitex is a cation exchange polymer containing a calcium sorbitol counterion. Petiramir is a high-capacity potassium binder. As petiramir moves through the intestinal tract, it exchanges calcium for potassium and is eliminated by the fecal route. Petiramir works throughout the GI tract, but is specifically designed to bind potassium in the colon where the highest concentration of potassium is found. Petiramir is selective for potassium, but can also bind to magnesium. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, or SZC, is an inorganic crystalline cation exchange polymer. SZC is a potassium binder that works throughout the intestinal tract. SZC exchanges hydrogen and sodium for potassium and is eliminated by the fecal route. SZC is highly selective for potassium. Other cations are too small to bind to SZC, including magnesium and calcium and sodium. SZC can also bind to ammonium. Well, now that we've seen how these drugs work and their mechanism of action, it's time to, quote, meet the patients. And so we're going to look at three different case scenarios here, and we're going to discuss them. And uh, this is going to cement your knowledge, hopefully, of how to use these in clinical scenarios. So let me introduce now Dr. Ileana Pena, who's going to talk about hyperkalemia in patients with heart failure, causes, and solutions. Ileana. Thank you, George. I think that was a great review of potassium and something that I think we often don't pay attention to, but something that we, we do need to pay attention to. So in, in heart failure, we, we see hyperkalemia. 
But we also see hypokalemia. And from this curve that you showed, it was very clear that the low potassium is also not good. So I work very hard to try to keep my patients as eukalemic as possible. And this applies to both HEFREF and HEFPEF because some of the drugs are rather similar and they're going to do exactly the same thing. And for hypokalemia, if I see a patient get hypokalemic, to me, it means that they need more RAS inhibition or that I need to now really add that spironolactone or even uptitrate the spironolactone. But when when we see this hyperkalemia, what do many of my colleagues do is say immediately discontinue the RASI and say, this is hyperkalemia, we can't deal with it. But we know now so much better that it is not the right thing to do. And for a long time, we didn't have the data, but I think now that we do have the data, we really need to pay attention. RAS inhibitors are really the foundation of the guideline-directed medical therapy, or GDMT as we like to call it, for HEFREF in stages C and D. These are the patients that usually now get referred to heart failure programs because they have probably been in the hospital several times. And you can see here under step three, there's spironolactone right up there, but under step two, we have the ACE, the ARB, and now the ARNI. And they're very similar in their effects on hyperkalemia. And as we get to more refractory heart failure, sometimes these patients won't tolerate the drugs as well, and we start pulling them off. And then if not, they go into what we consider the advanced therapies, which could be palliative, could be myocardial uh, heart transplant, could be an LVAD, or be put into some study. Um, another colleague and dear friend, Murray Epstein, really looked at this about removing the RAS uh, inhibitors in patients specifically who had heart failure. And it's really very, very clear to see that the patients that the RASI was discontinued had higher mortality. This is not just a number of events, this is mortality. And the patients who were in submac dose were very, very similar. And the patients who did the best were the patients who were at the max dose. So I think the, the argument um, has been resolved. It is not a good idea to remove these drugs. And what do the guidelines tell us? Well, the U.S. guidelines from 2013 and 2017 haven't said much, but there's new guidelines coming. We think maybe in the summer of 2021 they may be out. However, the ACC in 2020 put out a really beautiful paper on the abnormalities of potassium, and they define that 5.5 or greater is the action threshold for potassium binders. So this is the first time that we're hearing a professional society talk about the potassium binders. The ESC since 2018 have it in their guidelines. This is their expert consensus document, but there's also a brief statement in their guidelines about using the potassium binders as enablers, which is a different word that we have usually heard in heart failure. So for that hyperkalemia of greater than 5.5, I want everybody to take a pause. You know, we draw these labs and we send them to the lab or we let them sit there in the clinic and then they go to the lab in the afternoon. Think about potassium itself. If the specimen is hemolyzed, if the specimen has been sitting there for a while, you may have a higher potassium. What else do we think about? Well, let's, let's take up the loop diuretic. Or, in, or make it more uh, uh, frequent or increase the dose. What about potassium supplements? A lot of these patients have been taking potassium supplements for years, and they use potassium supplements as a salt substitute because the salt substitutes, in fact, are KCL. Older patients with uh, rheumatologic and arthritic conditions may be using non-steroidal. So taking a good history and what is the diet? And remember the diets are very cultural and you may have to find out what the dietary norms are in that particular home. Replacing an ACE inhibitor with Secubitril Valsartan may not change anything because the potassium may still be elevated and we knew this even with Valsartan, which is a piece of the combination. Adapting the MRA dose, if you're at 25, you may have to come down to 12.5. And even in the RALS trial, there was a possibility of every other day. But think about the potassium binder before you reach in there and remove the RASI.
For hypokalemia, you want to get rid of the thiazides. You do want to add that MRA, and you do want to uptitrate and maximize or optimize, a better word, the ACE, the ARB, and the ARNI, and then monitor the potassium and the creatinine levels, which I think we all do, and we do it very well. The ESC has diagnostic thresholds and recommended interventions, and they talk about the binder, and they talk about it with chronic recurrent hyperkalemia to start the binder once that potassium hits 5. That's their baseline, even though I can tell you that Europeans are often much more comfortable with those higher levels than we are. And they divide it up into 4.55, 5 to 6.5. So I like this because it's a very um, detailed something that you can use in your office and something that your office staff will know once those potassiums come back. Well, let's look at a little bit of the trials going on. So Harmonize was SCC's trial to look for doses. And the inclusion criteria were patients who had a greater than 5.1 or equal to 5.1 and could get the repeated blood draws. They took informed consent, and after a 48 hour of open label 10 grams of SEC, they were randomized. And they were randomized to all these different doses, um, especially if the potassium was up and down. And what did they see? Absolutely, there's a dose ranging effect in Harmonize, and so as the doses go up, the potassium goes down. But notice that you really don't hit rock bottom of like three something. It, it sits somewhere in between 4.2 and 4.4. And looking at it now by days, once you get that potassium stabilized, it remains pretty darn stable. And this is across a month of, of uh, treatment. The Diamond Study for Petirimer, this is a study that we are now doing to try to determine if, in fact, if you can keep the patients on RASI because you are now adding a potassium binder, in this case, petirimer, what will happen to these patients in outcome? So this is actually an outcome trial. We anticipate it's going to be about two and a half year. The randomization happens after a 12-week run-in to optimize the RASI and optimize the MRA. So these are HEFREF patients who have uh, known um, heart failure, and they have potassiums that have hit five or greater. And then when they get randomized, you can randomize them to pterimer or to placebo, and then what happens to them after that. So I'm going to talk about Wilma, which was one of the cases that, that George very clearly uh, mentioned. So this is a, a lady who's a non-smoker. She weighs 175 pounds. You can see her BMI here. She had, a, she has a ref ref uh, uh, diagnosis, class three four, and that becomes stage C. She has had multiple hospitalizations, an old history of hypertension, and a known dilated cardiomyopathy. Has no cardiac history in her family, but does have a strong history of hypertension. So she presents with the hospital now. She's short of breath. She can't lie down. She can't sleep, and I think anyone who can't sleep because they can't lie down really does belong in the hospital. She's taken extra furosemide, hasn't helped. Here's her blood pressure right around 100 where people start getting nervous. Heart rate 95, so she's a little on the tachycardic side and has a few crackles, even though clear lungs would tell me nothing different. Her JVP is elevated, so this lady is volume overloaded and has an S3, which tells you that her intraventricular pressures are high. She's on low sartan 50, probably because of some questions of ACE um, allergy, quote unquote. Carvedilol, tiny doses, 12 and a half. Furosemide at 80 twice a day, which is a good big dose. She's on an aspirin, 81 milligrams daily. She's on hydrochlorothiazide for her hypertension. And she takes the 220 milligrams of naproxen any, every 12 hours. So here are the labs. Fasting glucose is okay. Her HDL is low. This is postmenopausal. Her A1C is 5. Her creatinine is 2, which gives her a GFR of about 55. And her potassium is sitting right there on that border of 5. Sodium is 134, which means to me she is hyponatremic, and that's not a good sign. Bicarb 24, all her liver enzymes are fine. And so the initial management could be 
Let's give her some more furosemide now, IV. Let's stop the losartan because we're worried about the, about the blood pressure, the beta blocker. Oh, she must be decompensating because of the beta blocker. And let's put her on a low sodium diet. And then what happens? Eight hours, she's diuresis four liters. Everybody's high-fiving themselves. She's less short of breath. Her blood pressure is better, but her JVP is still elevated. So even though she's diuresis, that's not the end of the game. So in this patient, what would you recommend for management, George? Um, do you want to stop all the chronic medications? Maybe put her on hydralazine and nitrates. You know, that's the vasodilator combination. Or what about changing losartan to either valsartan or candesartan and continue carvedilol until diuresis improves and then start the spironolactone or just put her on secubitril valsartan? What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I'm not a big fan of hydralazine and nitrates, so that's out. Um, I'm, as you know, I'm always sure, so that's out. And going from an ARB to an ARB with something that affects natriuretic peptides, I mean, I'm not sure you're going to get a lot of mileage out of that. So I think really three is the best answer. Um, Candesartan definitely is longer acting, definitely has much more data uh, than the other two. And uh, clearly continue a beta blocker here, definitely needs diuresis. I would, until you optimize her a little bit more, I probably would hold the, the Spiro for a bit, but then I would definitely start it because Spiro is needed here. So I think three is the right way to go. What was actually done was that Losartan was replaced with Candesartan. Losartan is a weak arb that really should be given BID in 50 milligrams, it doesn't cut it. Candesartan, which is once a day, much easier for adherence, and you have a big range of doses. IV furosemide is given early. I usually pair it up with IV nitroglycerin so that I can lower central pressures and improve renal blood flow. She's put on spironolactone and she's referred to the clinic for a 10-day post-discharge follow-up. And here are her labs. Blood pressure stayed pretty much the same, but now that JVP is 8. The potassium just hit 5. The sodium is better. The creatinine didn't change much and her waist circumference is essentially the same. So here is a very typical patient that what are we going to do when these patients come in? And everybody does things how they've been trained and they, they do things how they've done maybe with the last patient. But here's a very reasonable um, uh, follow-up plan. And then of course she would get another appointment and that potassium needs to be checked. George, back to you. Eliana, thank you very much. Uh, you, you've got a great uh, segment that you just heard about uh, causes and solutions of uh, problems with heart failure. I'm going to talk to you about chronic kidney disease. So I think we have to understand that you can't just talk about the kidney and you can't just talk about the heart. Yes, I know that's how you were taught. Unfortunately, that's not how Mother Nature put us together. So you need to understand that there's a marriage going on here, whether you realize it or not. And as in all spousal relationships, if one organ isn't doing well, the other one is not going to do well by default. And so you just heard the story about when the heart isn't doing well. I will tell you when the heart isn't doing well, the kidney isn't doing well. It tries its best, but it can't totally compensate. And so if the function is reduced, it's going to be reduced even more because it's overwhelmed. Now, RASC uh, inhibitors have been known to help both the heart and the kidney for almost 30 years. And so we really cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. And these are the most recent guidelines, both from the American Diabetes Association and the International Kidney Group. And clearly, both in your face mandate ACE and ARB use in people with diabetes and in people with kidney disease, regardless of the diabetes, especially if albuminuria is present. So you've seen this slide from Dr. Pena talking about heart failure, and I'm showing it to you, showing looking at uh, CKD stages three and four. So that's GFR 59 down to 30. And you can see here, there's a lot of physicians 
that don't want to hurt anybody. They, they want to give low doses or half doses. And so here you can see the people that got submaximal doses of RASI did not have the mortality reduction that they did when they got maximal dose. And so it's not just true in heart failure, it's also true in kidney disease that you do need to maximize these doses. And by the way, the clinical trials have all maximized these doses. Again, I showed you this before. And again, I think you need to understand dialysis is not going to solve everything. You need to have a strategy for super acute management, subacute, and then longer term management. And this longer term management is where the potassium binders come in, but you've got to start them during the immediate phase so they can take effect within a few hours. Now, there are recent guidelines. This is a paper, and I apologize that this is so stretched out, but it is a classic paper, and I certainly urge you to read it. Yes, I'm biased because I was part of this group, but we put together a consensus report on the whole spectrum of potassium, hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. And we really try to focus on a lot of the points that we're making in this talk. So EKG changes are one thing. And obviously, if you have EKG changes, you're going to give calcium and you're going to give other solutions. But other than calcium, if the answer is no, you're still going to go through an exercise that you normally go through. And this includes, by the way, you'll notice in this algorithm, a potassium binder. So this has now been put into the cocktail of managing potassium issues, uh, hyperkalemia specifically, in CKD. Now, the harmonized trial you've heard about, and here you can see levels of potassium specified and what happened to them over 48 hours. And you can see here people with a history of CKD had a nice reduction. And in general, people are going to have a reduction within 48 hours. Why? Because I told you, it's not because they're binding potassium in the gut. They haven't even gotten to the level of the gut where they're going to do this. However, given the chemistry of this molecule and the pH of the stomach, they transform into a base. And as you know, when pH goes up, potassium moves into the cells. And this is really what you're experiencing here, a short-lived phenomena. So don't be fooled, but it does buy you time. And so the safety and tolerability we talked about already. Edema is the major issue, and it is dose-dependent. There's no question about it. It's dose-dependent. And it is a factor of how much sodium you're delivering to these patients. Because edema, uh, especially seen, mostly seen, at the 15 gram dose is what you're going to find with this agent. And of course, if the potassium is not that high, you could see hypokalemia at the higher doses as well because it does bind fairly reasonably. Now, the amethyst trial is a trial that I headed up and we did this looking at pteromir. And this is a phase two study. And you can see here the bottom line the, um, the details of the trial. Uh, we looked at two cohorts looking at two different levels of potassium, as you can see. But all of these people were on an ACE inhibitor, um, notably Losartan, at 100 milligrams a day. And we could add spironolactone, 25 milligrams a day, because these were people with diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. And so they also had hypertension. And so you can see here, we looked at the dosing range of pteromir going out over one year, one year. And you can see here that not only was potassium well controlled, but it extended over the entire year. So you had consistent potassium control, which you do not have with SPS. And you had tolerability over one year. The dropout rate, as you can see there, was not very high. Constipation, as I told you before, was by far the number one side effect. And again, when you're looking at this, what about dialysis patients during a hemodialysis uh, session? Are you removing a lot of potassium? 
And I've already told you that the potassium removal during dialysis is right there. You can see it on the right side of your screen. And what happens when dialysis finishes? Literally within hours, your potassium level goes right back up. And so, again, you're removing extracellular potassium. And remember, this is an intracellular cation. Now, the dialyzed trial was a multi-center, double-blind, phase three, randomized uh, control trial to look at safety and efficacy of SZC to reduce pre-dialysis hyperkalemia. So these are people with end-stage kidney disease, persistent hyperkalemia that were brought into the study. You can see their potassiums are well above five. And they were randomized to SZC once a day or placebo. And they got those on non-dialysis days for eight weeks. And you can see the dose titration there was over four-week periods. And the primary endpoint was the proportion of responders, that is, patients who maintain a potassium between four and five during three or more of the four hemodialysis treatments after the long interdialytic interval and didn't require rescue therapy. And you can see here, when you compare it to placebo, that the responders were 42% compared to 1%. So there was no question that SEC helped in dialysis patients as well as non-dialysis patients. And it does take the edge off, especially over a weekend uh, when you haven't gotten any dialysis. And you can see the safety issues here. And again, constipation was high, but most dialysis patients, you need to know, do have constipation. And again, they're being dialyzed. So edema is not going to be a major issue here, and it wasn't. So let's now turn to the practicum. So now we have Cesar, a 58-year-old Hispanic man with severe hypertension, CKD, and heart failure. So he's got the trifecta. And you can see that he's overweight, 231 pounds, and he's 5'10", a BMI of uh, 33.1. He's got stage 3BA2 CKD, and he's had 15-year history of uh, hypertension, 10-year history of elevated LDL cholesterol, and more than six years of CKD with a family history of diabetes. He presents to the hospital with a BP of 210 over 100, uh, BP of uh, 12 over 104 with a pulse of 80 uh, upon repeat. Um, physical exam, he's got two plus pitting edema to the ankles. He's got an S4 and a holosystolic murmur at the apex. Lungs are clear. His current medications are aspirin, low dose, resuvastatin 10, amlodipine 10, ramipril 10, uh, carbidolol 25 BID, and chlorothaladone 25. His labs are, as you can see them there, he's basically got uh, an elevated um, uh, hemoglobin A1C. Well, it's not elevated, it's slightly elevated, 6.2%. His uh, LDL cholesterol is 72, but his creatinine, his GFR, is 41 mLs per minute. His K is 4.9, bicarb 27, and he's got an albumin of 190 milligrams per gram, but normal kidney function. So, initial management. Labetalol drip was started and sent to the floor with a BP of 160 over 90. Amlodipine and ramipril were continued. He was changed to furosemide, 140 BID, given hydrolyzine, 100 milligrams TID, and isosorbide mononitrate 30 with carbetalol, 25 milligrams daily. The IV was stopped. 24 hours after admission, BP was 142 over 90 with occasional spikes to 160. Repeat labs showed a K of 4.9. Nephrology was called as the GFR fell to 35, and they suggested spironolactone, 12.5 milligrams daily. Within 24 hours, BP was reduced to 134 over 82, and the K now is 5.4. Okay, so now that you've heard the case, what's the next step that you'd recommend in the management? Keep going with the Spiro, 
and initiate an oral K-binder. Keep going with the Spiro, initiate IV insulin and bicarb. Discontinue the Spiro and initiate an oral K-binder. Discontinue the Spiro, initiate IV insulin and bicarb, or you just don't know. Well, this is a case where that blood pressure was really scary. Uh, and we can see horrendous LV dysfunction with those blood pressures. So I think a huge goal here is to keep his blood pressure as stable as possible and to bring it down. The other thing that concerns me is he has a, a, a murmur. He has a holosystolic murmur, which tells me he may have also some coronary disease sitting underneath there that with that blood pressure, he in fact has ischemic MR because that's probably what it is, it's MR. Um, so I really want to keep him on the spiro because the spiro is actually what brought down his blood pressure. And spironolactone is just a great adjunct for to add it to a RASI inhibitor to try to keep the blood pressure down. It's, it's a marvelous antihypertensive that, that's been used for years as an antihypertensive and, and very, very inexpensive. It's, I think, 15 cents a tablet. So this is somebody that I would really get that oral K binder and get the approval um, with my pharmacist early because I want to keep him on the spiro. That, that blood pressure was close to stroke level too, which we don't see a lot of strokes in, in the HEFREF population, but those pressures are very scary. Well, very good, Ileana, and that's exactly what we did. Spiro was, in fact, maintained. There's no reason to stop it. Guidelines recommend using Spiro or Plerinone in resistant hypertension. It's the fourth drug. K should be treated, however, with something that can be maintained after discharge. So, Batyramir or SCC. The patient was prescribed SCZ as it was on the formulary, and it reduced the potassium to 4.8 milliequivalents per liter, and other medications were continued. And the patient was referred to a clinical dietitian to further complement a lower potassium diet. Now, the labs at two weeks of follow-up, so coming back from the hospital, 138 over 82 BP, reasonably well-controlled, K is 4.8, albuminuria is dropped, by more than 50% to 84. Creatinine now is 1.9, and the waist circumference is 43. So, bottom line, that change, by the way, in uh, GFR was not a huge change, but it needed to be understood in the context of lower blood pressure and other things. Albuminuria has dropped, which would be expected. So these are all very positive findings, and the patient should be maintained on this going out long term. Now, with that, I'm going to move ahead to introduce Dr. Salvador, who is in fact a hospitalist himself, and is going to talk about team-based prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of hyperkalemia. Vince. That's a great talk, Dr. Bacris. Thank you. As hospitalists, we often manage patients at high risk of developing hyperkalemia. These same patients stand to gain the most from optimization of RAS blockers. It's a tricky dilemma. What if we have new options at our disposal to enable patients to continue these life-saving drugs while preventing hyperkalemia? Study has shown that following hospital discharge, about half of patients experience at least one medical error. The transition from hospital to the outpatient setting is a vulnerable period for complex patients. It's been documented that one in five patients developed an adverse event, most commonly due to medication, during the transition from hospital to home. But here's the kicker. Up to half of these adverse events were considered preventable. Despite our best efforts, good intentions, and time commitment devoted to ensuring a safe discharge process, some patients still end up getting readmitted for one reason or another. The Swiss cheese model illustrates how potential pitfalls could derail our built-in process in providing high-quality care during discharge process. As hospitalists, 
we have opportunities to address these potential weak points that may lead to adverse events, such as hyperkalemia. A number of published guidelines are available to help improve the quality of care transition. For instance, SHM's Project Boost compiles evidence-based intervention and best practices to promote high-quality discharge process. Alternatively, the National Quality Forum Report provides consensus standards on care transition and a portfolio of performance measures. CMS has developed 30-day readmission measures and linked payment reduction to hospitals' performance in reducing avoidable readmissions, like in heart failure. Ideally, we strive to deliver care in a patient-centered approach where members of the multidisciplinary team contribute their expertise in addressing the needs of the patient. The team is usually coordinated by the hospitalist who acts like a quarterback. However, this is not always well executed. Poor coordination and ineffective communication lead to patients getting lost in the complexity of the healthcare system. Imagine how frustrating it is for our patients and their families. Our patients have certain expectations from the medical team. They expect us to ensure a smooth transition to an outpatient setting. They expect us to provide knowledge, skills, and resources to perform new self-care responsibilities to deal with their chronic comorbidities. Most importantly, they expect us to talk to their primary care provider to discuss about the recent hospital course and the subsequent treatment plans. The question remains, why is it important to improve care transitions in the first place? Ineffective care transition is associated with worse patient outcomes, dissatisfied patients and staff, waste of resources, and increased readmission rates, which cost billions of dollars annually. To support hospitalists, SHM provides resources that could be customized to enhance the quality of care transition. So how do we enhance the quality of care transition? An ideal care transition has been described as composed of 10 domains that provide structural support to the bridge the patient has to cross from the hospital to the outpatient setting. The idea is that missing domains make the bridge weaker that could lead to gaps in care transition. As one of the Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goals, accurate medication reconciliation can reduce readmission when bundled with other interventions. To be effective, a best possible medication history should be elicited from various sources at the outset. This can be accomplished with the help of our colleagues, the pharmacist and pharmacy technician. During the discharge, it's important to reconcile all changes throughout the hospitalization and communicate the reconciled medication regimen to patients and providers across the continuum of care. When we prescribe certain medications on discharge, a number of factors may affect adherence. Evidence suggests inverse association between out-of-pocket cost and the likelihood of adherence to a newly prescribed medication. Having said that, there are available resources online to guide prescribing decisions. You can also compare prices, avail of discounts and coupons for certain prescriptions. Depending on the eligibility of your patient, patient assistance program may help to get medications for free or at a reduced cost. Improving care transition has been the major focus of National Quality Forum. To improve patient experience and engagement, the patient should be involved in every step of formulating the treatment plan across the continuum of care. The quality of care coordination could be assessed through the use of care plans, patient education about medications, 
and referral to self-management support programs. We know that there are barriers to ensuring a smooth transition of care. Some of these barriers are amenable for targeted interventions. A risk assessment tool such as 8PIS could help identify patients' risk factors for readmission that need to be mitigated prior to discharge. Some of these risk factors are problems with medications, principal diagnosis, poor health literacy, prior hospitalization in the past six months, and palliative care. The aim is to risk identify rather than risk stratify. For instance, in the case of hyperkalemia, one might need to probe deeper into the medications which can affect potassium homeostasis, such as ACE, ARBs, MRAs, NSAIDs, and even herbal supplements. The risk of hyperkalemia is also magnified in certain underlying conditions, such as advancing CKD, especially if EGFR is less than 45, diabetes, and heart failure. There are different models that integrate best practices for care transition. For instance, one of which is PARTNER, which is specifically designed for minority-serving institutions. In this particular model, a community health worker acts as a patient navigator who assesses patients' health-related social needs and schedule post-discharge home visit. A peer coach reaches out via phone calls at multiple time points, pre- and post-discharge, to follow up on what has been started by the navigator. While in theory, this model included multifaceted intervention during care transition, in the actual evaluation of the program, the intervention did not significantly improve patient experience and healthcare utilization when compared to usual care. Nonetheless, the results of the study must be interpreted with some caution due to missing data on follow-up, limited external validity, and incomplete implementation of peer coaching. There's no single intervention known to reliably address readmissions. However, there are common themes identified among multi-component interventions that led to improved outcomes for older adults with chronic diseases, as shown in this slide. When transitional care intervention is implemented well, it is associated with consistent reduction in hospital readmission and all-cause mortality up to 18 months. Let's integrate what we've learned so far in a case scenario. Duke is a 70-year-old black male with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, CKD stage 4A2 with an EGFR of 28, chronic systolic heart failure with ejection fraction of 30%, diabetes type 2 for the past 20 years, atrial fibrillation, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, and osteoarthritis. He presents to the ED with a two-week history of progressive dyspnea on exertion. He also reports poor appetite, cough, orthopnea, worsening bilateral leg edema, and decreasing urine output. For the past two days, he's also been having nausea and vomiting. On physical exam, he is tachycardic at 122, tachypnic at 28, saturating 95% on five liters nasal cannula. There is notable JVD, irregularly irregular rhythm, with estrogallop, holosystolic murmur at the apex, with positive hepatojugular reflux, mid to basal fine crackles, and 2 plus bipedal pitting edema. His medications, as verified by the pharmacist, are as follows. Take note that he's not on optimal regimen for heart failure. He's also taking over the counter pain regimen ibuprofen as needed. Diagnostic tests on admission show mild hyponatremia 
severe hyperkalemia at 6.5 with bicarbonate at 15, elevated BUN at 52, creatinine at 6.7 with an EGFR of 8. His urinalysis is significant for 2 plus protein, 2 plus glucose. His chest x ray is notable for bibasilar interstitial infiltrates and cardiomegaly. ECG confirms atrial fibrillation in rapid ventricular response. In the ED, he was given calcium gluconate, insulin IV plus dextrose, albuterol nebulization, bicarbonate IV, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate for hyperkalemia. He was also given metoprolol IV for heart rate control and furosemide 60 mg IV, but there was no urine output. Nephrology and cardiology services were consulted. He was then referred for admission to the hospitalist service. After completion of medication reconciliation, both losartan and spironolactone were held while ibuprofen was stopped. He was then started on dialysis. 24 hours after admission, on repeat blood tests, his serum potassium dropped to 4.7 while creatinine improved to 4.1. At that point, both losartan and spironolactone were resumed for heart failure. The following day, his serum potassium bumped up to 5.6. Let me ask Dr. Pina, if you were the clinician involved in this case, how would you approach the medication changes in view of the hyperkalemia? It's a difficult case and not, not too uncommon. And now the decision is made, do you want to withdraw the good medical therapy that he needs? This gentleman went into AFib and probably went into AFib because his heart failure and his renal function was getting worse. And so you need to address the underlying reasons for him getting worse. So um, I'm not a big low heart user for the reasons that I've said before. Weak, uh, needs to be given BID. But I would leave him on the losartan and the spironolactone. And uh, this is a case that I would start the potassium binder and I would start, I start it early um, as to get the patient on the regimen of potassium binding. And I've done this before and it really works well. I usually hold the ACE and the ARB on the day of dialysis, for example, if the decision has been made uh, and give it after the dialysis is done so that you don't get the drop in blood pressure. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Pino, for sharing your insights on this. So here's what happened. Lostartan was resumed while spironolactone was stopped for the time being. He was started on maintenance regimen of patiromer. This is based on the evolving recommendation on enabling the optimization of RAS blockers by using oral potassium binders if indicated. The practice aid included in this program has reference on the management for hyperkalemia. His serum potassium eventually declined to 4.1, and at that point, spironolactone was resumed. He was also started on amiodarone for atrial fibrillation by cardiology. As part of self-management, he was referred to dietitian for comprehensive education on low potassium diet. Physical and occupational therapy services were consulted. The social worker arranged for home health services needed as determined by the physical therapy and occupational therapy services. The discharge navigator conducted discharge education and arranged for outpatient clinic follow-up with the PCP and subspecialist. Meanwhile, the pharmacist facilitated prior authorization for oral potassium binder. On the day of the discharge, the hospitalist completed the medication reconciliation and called the patient's primary care physician to provide updates about the hospital course, medication changes, and pending labs. Finally, a repeat blood test was scheduled in the next one week. This concludes my section Back to Dr. Bacris. Well, Vince, that was excellent and uh, really a great case, a great interaction with Ileana. And um, 
hope the audience got something out of that because that is definitely real world and complex. So what are the key take home points? Patients who are at high risk of readmission for hyperkalemia can be identified from clinical data. Hospitalists can prevent unnecessary rehospitalization for hyperkalemia by collaborating with other healthcare providers to reduce the risk, completing an accurate medical reconciliation, initiating oral potassium binders that patients can access and continue using at home and are well tolerated. And newer potassium binders definitely work faster and are tolerated better than SPS. So they also are enablers. They enable life-saving therapy of RASI and MRAs in patients with CKD. Very important points and or heart failure, by the way. We have a lot of questions here that are being asked. We have very little time, so let's just jump right into them. First of all, how can I know beforehand who's going to develop hyperkalemia? And that's pretty straightforward. There's a paper that we published in 2014 in the Seminars of Nephrology, and it's basically two things. Very simple. Boils down to two things. Number one, those that have an estimated GFR of less than 45 and or those that have a baseline potassium of 4.8 or higher that are already on diuretics. If you have those patients, either one of those or both, the probability they're going to develop hyperkalemia is anywhere from six to eight fold. So very important point. And related to that, with the level of potassium to treat, that's related to your concomitant problems. If you have heart failure, kidney disease, diabetes, if you have all of those things, then you really need to start treating potassium at level of 5 to 5.1. If you don't have any of those things, then you certainly can wait till 5.5, 5.6 before you have any cardiovascular issues. There were a number of questions related to the case, and I'm going to let Dr. Pena respond to this. Why did we change the candesartan from losartan? Do both ARBs have similar AE issues for hyperkalemia? And then related to that, Ileana, why did we stop the hydrochlorothiazide? She has hyponatremia and renal failure. Go ahead. It's all yours. Thank you, George. And thank you to the person who sent that question. So if you compare ARBs, losartan is a very weak ARB. And the studies of heart failure were actually negative. Candosartan is probably the best studied of all the ARBs. And what I like about it is, number one, it has a big range of dosing. You can go anywhere from four up to 32 that has been studied, and it's once a day. So it promotes adherence in these patients who are taking so many other things. Hydrochlorothiazide can be added. For example, it's a good blood pressure drug, but you have to be careful with your potassium, with your sodium. Hyponatremia is not a good sign in heart failure, and you don't want to re-stimulate the renin angiotensin system. So be more careful about using those kinds of diuretics. I think just, again, for the person that asked this question, hyponatremia from hydrochlorothiazide definitely happens in older females that have hypertension, but in heart failure, there are many other mechanisms that contribute, so you need to appreciate that. Vince, there's a question here about insulin glucose drips in hyperkalemia and diabetic nephropathy. What are your thoughts about this? Sure. Thank you for the question. You know, insulin itself is part of the temporizing measures for acute management of hyperkalemia. Insulin works by promoting redistribution of serum potassium into the intracellular space, but it does not reduce the total body potassium. As for the role of continuous insulin drip versus an insulin IV push, I haven't used that in my practice and I'm not aware of any studies that differentiated the two. But in essence, whether it's an IV push or an IV drip, it does not reduce the total body potassium. And the same goes for calcium. It does not reduce your total serum body potassium, but it only prevents arrhythmia by stabilizing the cardiac membrane. Let me follow up with that, Vince. When do you recommend giving calcium gluconate for acute hyperkalemia? So whenever there is a severe hyperkalemia more than 6 or, you know, or 6.5 in some you know, threshold 
I would give calcium gluconate. However, I have to caution you that in some patients, they may not always achieve severe range of hyperkalemia, even as low as 5.8, 5.9. They may be already manifesting EKG changes like peak T waves. That's when you you have to give calcium gluconate to somehow stabilize your cardiac membrane. You know, it varies. So some patients, especially if the potassium rises quickly, you might need to give this right away to prevent cardiac arrhythmia, even if there is no abnormal EKG changes. So that's really the key. It's but calcium is not doing anything to lower potassium. It's a stabilizer of the membrane. So just remember that. Ileana, there's a question here. I'm going to answer part of it. I'm going to let you answer part of it. Basically, worrying about edema from potassium binders, and should you still be on a low potassium diet? Low potassium diet is like treating hypertension. You need to be on a low sodium diet as a base. You absolutely need to be on a low potassium diet if people have hyperkalemia, because that actually will protect you against further hyperkalemia in certain circumstances. It won't totally protect you, but it'll give you some added protection. So Ileana, what binders are going to give you edema? Which ones are not? What do we know about this? Right. So I have the most experience with pteromer because that's what we had on the formulary. And I have never seen edema from pteromer. Localma has been used widely already. It's out on the market. But the edema seems to happen at the higher doses. So you really want to avoid those high doses. And if you've got somebody who's getting a lot of edema, then you probably should switch over to pteromer to prevent the edema if you're needing higher doses. Generally, these drugs are very well tolerated and you can probably get away with a lot at low doses. And by the way, if you get that potassium controlled, you can let the patient liberalize her potassium in their diet a little bit more so that they don't feel so tortured because we're limiting their sodium and we're trying to limit their potassium too. What are they going to eat? Excellent point. So just very simply, forget about K-exalate, but tiramir, you have to worry about constipation, not edema. Localma, you do need to worry about edema at high doses, but at starting doses and moderate doses, the edema is minimal. Now, here's a question. I'll answer this and Ileana, I'll give you a shot if you want to chime in. Does furosemide remain the diuretic of choice to remove potassium? And the answer to that question is yes. It's fast acting. It's very effective, especially when given IV. And eumetanide, which is also highly effective and very good, especially if you have low albumin, is more expensive and doesn't really do that much of a better job. I don't know, Ileana, what do you think? Yeah, I still use furosemide, and before we've talked about how sorry we are that IV torsemide is no longer available, but IV torsemide was a terrific diuretic. So for cost issues, I very, very rarely will use bumetanide, and I stick to furosemide. It's cheap, it's easy, it's available in just about every floor in the hospital, and pharmacy can get it to you very quickly. And you give them a good zap of furosemide, you'll get the potassium down. All right. There's two questions here. I'm going to answer the first one. I'm going to answer partially the second one. What's the fast way to get the potassium down in hospitalized patients? You need to calm down. All right. You need to, first of all, take your own pulse. If you see an elevated potassium, first of all, make sure that it's real. That's the first thing. Secondly, remember the people who get in trouble with potassium, it's not the level of potassium, it's the rate of rise. So those that have very quick increases in potassium, they're the ones that are going to be in trouble. I've seen people walking around with Ks of seven seven and a half. They don't feel good, but they're not in trouble because it slowly went up. I've seen people code with Ks going up very quickly. So very important to know that as long as you're doing all the standard things that we've talked about already to do this and you start a potassium binder at the time you're starting this, by the time those acute therapies have worn off, you're already starting to see a reduction in potassium. Now, the second thing is hypercalcemia, the tiramir. Can you get hypercalcemia with the tiramir? The answer is yes. However, having said this, I've been using it for over two years. I have never seen a case. There are case reports. I know it's possible, especially if you're taking in large amounts of calcium because it is a calcium-based binder, but I have just not seen it. Eliana, what's your experience? It's the same thing. I tell the house staff, take a deep breath, relax. And it's how rapidly that potassium went up that would worry me. And I've seen case, maybe not of seven, but I've seen case of six where the EKG appears perfectly stable. 
If I'm going to admit that patient, do I want to monitor them? Yes. I think it's the safest to go ahead and monitor them. And I'm sure Vince does that with his patients in the hospital, but it really is the rapidity. And remember, the changes are things like the widening of the QRS. That really happens way later with very high rapid increases. Somebody is lysing and developing rapid hyperkalemia. Those are the people that you worry about. Okay, very good. Quick question. Any prophylactic GI treatment needed for these new molecules? Short answer, no, it isn't. There's nothing needed. Now, Vince, I'm going to ask you a question. What are the challenges in setting up a multidisciplinary care team for patients and how are you addressing them? Well, it depends on the institution that you're in. I do have to recognize the fact that it's complex to set up this multidisciplinary team. It takes a substantial amount of resources to plan, implement, and monitor you know, the interventions, especially if it's a multi-pronged interventions. First of all, you have to assess you know, the capacity, you know, the resources in the institution. We also have to understand the culture in the institution, the involvement of the executive leadership, if there is a buy-in from the frontline staff. After that, of course, we have tools available you know, with SHM to help you get started. And there's this specific mentored implementation program by Boost. Yeah, so those are just some of the you know, barriers. And of course, I mean, when you're trying to identify those barriers to implementing this multidisciplinary intervention, you have to go the upper topmost problem, like the system level, the policy, and even the patient themselves may also have shortcomings that you might need to address. And we've discussed that in one part of the presentation in, you know, in identifying those barriers, specifically the eight Ps that hopefully can be used or implemented in an institution to identify the barriers that might you know, lead to readmission of a high-risk patients. All right, very good. Ileana, can we combine Valsartan and Secubitrol and add spironolactone with it. What's the potassium and creatinine level that we'd have to discontinue this or would add potassium binding? Yeah, I think there's a misconception that Secubitril valsartan will give less hyperkalemia, say in patients with some element of CKD. That's not true. It's equally hyperkalemia producing. So there's really no greater advantage in the potassium sense. Obviously, you have a higher mortality, mortality benefit, et cetera. Adding the spironolactone, the same thing, but I am very, very pro the MRAs, the spironolactone, the aplerinone. And if you're starting at 25 and you run into trouble with the potassium, rather than just pulling the drug off, cut it in half. It's one of your options, or you can even give it QOD. So you can cut down. So I'll cut down to 12 and a half. And if that doesn't quite do it, then I'll go to every other day. 12 and a half. And if you look at the RALS trial, which we did for heart failure, that's exactly what they did. They had the option of cutting it back. Now, the opposite is also true. If the patient's doing extremely well and you can get away with going up on the dose to 50, then do it. But warn your patients who are on these potassium binders that they should not be stopping the potassium binder just on their own. Give us a call, send us a note, send us an email, and let us know that you're not able to take it. Maybe you have some GI issues and you know you have a virus and you get sick and you're not taking it, please let us know. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. But listen, thank you very much to the audience for participating and giving us these really great questions. Thank you to the panel and thank you to all of you for listening. And we hope you got something out of it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education.